Hi there, and welcome to a very fun episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Jamie Hampton, and I am here and really excited to have Mandy Ariato here with us. And she is president and CEO of Mops International, and she is widely known for her unique takes on parenting, relationships, spiritual, and cultural issues. She and her husband, Joe, live in Denver, Colorado with their three awesome kids. And Mandy is also an author and speaker. And today we have brought her on the show specifically to talk about her new book, Have More Fun. So welcome to the podcast, Mandy. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. So for those of you listening, you might think, why is a praying Christian women podcast talking about having more fun? But I guarantee if you listen to the end, you are going to find out. <laughs> and it's really, I, I just really believe that what Mandy has to say today is really relevant and really important for us as praying Christian women. So hang on and, and you will definitely see why we're talking about this specific topic. Um, but first, I just want you all, I know many of our listeners already know you, Mandy, but I just would love for them to get to know you a little bit better. So we have a just for fun question that we like to ask on some of our interviews. So our just for fun question is, President and CEO of MOPS is how you're often introduced, but if you had to define yourself apart from that role with three titles, like fun titles, what would those be? <laughs> that is such a great question. Okay, my three titles would be hip hop wannabe, peacemaker, and tea connoisseur. I like that. Those are good. So I have to ask about the first one. So you're a hip hop wannabe. How does I... that mean? want so badly to be a really excellent hip hop dancer and it's just not in me but like i dance around a, our house i will take dance lessons i just i really really want to just like hit the dance floor and have a circle gather around me and just bust out some amazing moves it has not happened up until this point in my life but i am determined that it will I can't wait. You need to share that with us. When that happens, we want to be there with you to we'll see. Will do. Will do. To let us know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, another fun fact. So, as I was listening, just to prepare for this interview, I knew about your book. I love your podcast, by the way. Have more fun with uh -huh. Mandy Arioto. Um, so, all of y'all need to check that out because it really is just a very. Um, it's not frivolous. It's fun, but it's not frivolous. It's very cool and just very heartfelt. And I've loved the, the episodes that I've listened to. But in, in kind of watching some YouTube stuff that you've done, I realized that we both have a common love. We both love quantum physics. I <gasps> thought that was awesome. Oh my goodness. Yes. That mm. is just so fascinating to me. And I feel like in so many ways, quantum physics is the science of studying God at work in the world. I totally agree. And Alana, my co-host and I are both science nerds. We just, we both majored in science in college and we've talked about the science of prayer and we just, we really love science and definitely feel that going deeper with science, um, studying science is studying God. It's studying who he is and what he did and how he did it. And it's amazing. And the one, the one thing that I really thought kind of has something to do with this have more fun topic before we dump, jump into it is um, that you had talked about like the, the synchronization of pendulum swinging, this quantum physics idea that two objects that are close together will begin to synchronize, whether it's pendulum swinging, whether it's people and, you know, I mean, if we want to get into it, we're all women here. Mm -hmm. Women and their cycles will synchronize. Animals and their cycles will synchronize in livestock, things like that. And you made a comment in one of your videos that I was watching um, that you're making a difference just by showing up. And I loved that. That was so encouraging to me because it's saying, you know, you're, you're, putting energy out there or putting spiritual um, substance out there just by doing honor to who God has made you and being obedient to him and living your life for Christ, you're making a difference. You're making ripples in, in the waters of life and you're impacting people around you as they receive that and begin to maybe become synchronized by that. And I just want to know, how do you see that with in your own life with having more fun? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So this whole idea of synchronization even happens like when we're laying in bed next to our kids at night and our heart rates start to sink and our brain patterns start to sync up. So I find it so fascinating. And I think in the world right now, we are living in this time where people feel anxious, like rates of anxiety and depression are epidemic. Our news cycles are just on constant um, negative, depressing news. And so this idea of what if we show up in the world as people who have fun, who have regained a sense of joyfulness, and who walk in ways that is expectant, that good things will happen. I just wonder if we step in a room with that type of, I'm going to use the word energy, but you know, it doesn't have to be new agey energy. It's just how we approach um, our lives. I think that could profoundly change the entire framework of how our culture and our world is operating at the moment. And I love that. And, and I do think that that is why it's so relevant to our spiritual lives, which we're going to get into a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I'm really excited about, about you sharing some of your thoughts on this. So first of all, I want to know what inspired the book, Have More Fun. And I actually know now that I've read the first chapter, because I got the first chapter <laughs> sent to me, but I want you to share, did it come from a personal revelation or something you did well, but you found lacking in Christian culture or just what inspired this book in your life? So last year, I recognized that there was a point in my life where the previous 10 years had just caught up with me. And the past um, 10 years had been filled with a lot of grief and heartache and loss and disappointment. And there's this idea out there called death by paper cuts, where you kind of go through life and nothing that big or traumatic happens. But when you really take a good look at where you are, you realize that there have been a lot of little things that you thought really shouldn't impact you, but they've combined into this huge gaping wound that you didn't even realize was there until you really take a look at it. And you realize that you have stopped having fun, that you have lost your joy, that you've lost your peacefulness, and that you're kind of just operating on autopilot. And that's really what happened to me. I woke up one day and I recognized like I have completely forgotten what I enjoy doing. And my kids were playing in a back room one time and they were laughing and having so much fun together. And I went back there and I yelled at them for having, for being too loud. And at that moment, as the words were coming out of my mouth, I recognized like, oh my goodness, like I think I have a problem on my hands and I'm yelling at my kids for laughing too loudly. <sighs> and I recognized I needed to have a reset in my life because I didn't want to get to the end of my life and recognize that the best thing about me was that I was really good at keeping up with email, right? Or keeping on top of the laundry or any of those things that kind of become a priority as an adult person. Um, but, and it's so easy to have them trump the fun the joy, the excitement, the delight of simply being alive. And so I chose for the next year that my one goal for the entire next 12 months was going to be simply to have more fun. And I have to tell you, it changed everything for me. Well, and in your book, you talk about how many different areas, and it might even be even just in the description, but it talks about how having more fun can be the answer to so many questions yes. like how do I improve my marriage and my sex life? How do I improve my relationship with my kids? How do I, I mean, it goes through like all of these like important facets of our lives. It is, it's the answer truly to so much. It really is. And I did a lot of scientific research about fun too, just because I was curious. And it really does come back to improving our marriage, improving our parenting, dealing with people who annoy us, when we take a posture of having fun with it instead of being offended by it, it revolutionizes how we interact with people. And so fun really is an antidote for so many of the things that are bothering us. Well, I have to ask you before we jump into the topics in the book, has it been hard for you in the serious position of being the president and CEO of a large organization? Like, have you been criticized or looked down upon or felt any hostility for people that think, well, Christian ministry has to be serious all the time. 
Oh, I get that all the time. Um, it's funny because we have a huge annual conference that we put on at MOPS. And last year, we had a lot of fun. We danced and sang and did all sorts of silly videos, but we also did some really deep work, like taking communion together and doing some real serious praying about finding freedom from the things that God wants us really to get, you know, unshackled from. Um, and I got criticized for the fun part. It's like we should only be focusing on the holiness of God. And I think so often as Christian people, we forget that God tells us to delight. There's even this really fascinating part in the Old Testament, and it's called the tithe of celebration, and I'm going to try and do my best to talk about it. But um, there was a portion of the tithe that was meant to go to something that was celebratory, that was that person would delight in. And I think it's just so evident of who God is, that he wants us to appreciate the life that he's given us. And that always helps me reframe my work when I'm getting criticized that, you know, this is important work and it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be focusing on the fun parts of it. Um, but I think having fun makes me a better leader. Even today we were out filming some promos and I was dressed up as Elsa from the movie Tangled. Oh. And <laughs> it was hilarious. And I have a lot of fun at my work because the people around me recognize that this work that we are called to is both holy and that we get to enjoy ourselves and that they don't have to be separate. I love that. And I, you know, and, and just thinking about this, I mean, God, God's the author of laughter. I mean, mm -hmm. he didn't have to make us joyful people. We could have been little robots or, you know, very serious and we could still enjoy God with a seriousness, but he's the author of laughter. He's the author of enjoyment and, um, and, and the author of fun. He really is. And I, I really appreciate that. And just want to encourage our listeners to, to think along those lines and, um, yeah, uh, just to, to be open to that and, and to know that fun doesn't have to mean frivolous. And I think that's what we've thought a lot, you know, well, that's for kids or it means that you're not serious, but you can be serious and have enjoyment. And, you know, Alana and I recently talked about, um, John Piper's book, Desiring God, where he talks about Christian hedonism, you know, taking mm -hmm. joy mm -hmm. and excitement in, pursuing God. So that's just, yeah. I'm, I'm I think that's it. such an important part. And I love that word. It's not, fr uh, the phrase is not frivolous. And I think there's such a, an important distinction, but I don't know about you, but I want to be the kind of person of faith who is compelling. Like when people who don't have a faith background, see how I live, I want it to be like, Oh, I want some of that. And I think when we're serious all the time and we don't allow space in our lives for delight and enjoyment that we're not very compelling as a person of faith to, for people to want to be like us. Yes. And, you know, that brings me to one of, I mean, you had me at chapter one. I can't wait to read the book. And so as we're recording this, the book is not out. Can you tell our listeners when Have More Fun is going to be released? Yeah, it comes out on April 9th. Okay, April 9th. So that is when this is airing, it will have just come out. So for all of you listeners, you can find Have More Fun on pretty much anywhere you buy books, right? Yes. Um, but at this point, I read chapter one, and I was just totally taken in. And my favorite part was the horse story. Could mm -hmm. you just very briefly share how that experience related to this idea of, of forgetting what it feels like to be fully alive. Totally. So I grew up on a horse farm, which is ironic because my mom was terrified of horses. But when I was eight years old, um, my dad decided he was going to add some new horses to our farm. And long story short, he, we meet this farmer who lives in Pennsylvania. And my dad and I head down to check out these two female horses who he thought might be a good addition to our barn. We get down there and we get introduced to the horses and they are 
gorgeous and uh, they're in their stalls and my dad's petting them and checking them out and seeing what he thinks. And he looks to the farmer and he's like, Hey, can I see the horses run out in the field? I want to check out their gates and just see them run and get a feel for their personalities. So this old farmer takes the two horses, walks them out to the field. And before they can even get through the gate, they've like flung the gate open and they're out there chasing each other and bucking and playing and eating the grass and rolling in the dirt. And as soon as my dad saw the life in these two horses, he's like, yep, those are our girls for sure. And so he and the farmer talk about the terms and um, when we're going to bring them home. And my dad explains that our barn is being remodeled and that we won't be able to pick them up for a couple of weeks. And the farmer's like, no problem. I've got it. You head home and come back when you're ready for them. So our barn, as most construction projects do, took longer than we anticipated. And three months went by. And finally, it's time for us to go and pick up our two new horses. And uh, we get down to the farm and everything looks different than it had the first time we were down there. The grass is overgrown. There's no animals out anywhere. And we get to, we park our car and, and find out that the farmer who we had been introduced to before had gotten injured the day after we left and hadn't been able to farm. And so because of that, he wasn't able to feed all the animals properly. He was feeding them the minimal amount that he could in order to get by until he could get well and start farming again. And so at this point, my dad realizes that these horses have been in their stall for three months because the farmer couldn't go out there to let them out and didn't have any help. And so my dad rushes out to the back opens the barn door and he realizes that he can't get the horses out because their doors push inward and their stalls are so full of manure that the doors won't budge. So he and I shovel manure for about 20 minutes, get it cleared out. And he goes to open the do- the horses stall doors. He tells me to, you know, step aside so you don't get run over as they run out since they haven't been out in three months. And so he pushes the doors open and the horses just stand there. And then my dad tries to like pull them out of their stalls with the lead line and they won't budge because they had forgotten what freedom felt like. They'd been standing in their own crap for three months and that was all that they could remember. And at this point, my dad just starts weeping because he recognizes that these two beautiful horses who had been so full of life and joy have completely forgotten who God created them to be. And so he decides that for the next couple of days, we're going to sleep in the barn with the horses. And we sleep there. My dad feeds them nourishing food over the next couple of days. And each time he feeds them, he leads them a little bit farther out of the barn until on the third day, he's regained their trust enough that they follow him out. And he walks them out through the gate and into the pasture. And the minute they walk through the gate and into the pasture. It's like they remember what it feels like to be alive. And they start running and chasing and bucking and rolling in the dirt and eating grass again and feeling the sun on their back. And we had a hard time getting them back in the barn that night because once you remember what freedom feels like, you never want to go back into captivity. And that story has stuck with me for almost 30 years now because in so many ways, I feel like their story is all of our story as well, right? We kind of get stuck we get uh, confined in small places. We forget what it feels like to be fully alive. And it takes our father to lead us back out into the pasture and regain our sense of aliveness. Oh, totally. And I, you know, and I also feel like we stuff ourselves into these boxes as Christian women mm-hmm. that we think we're supposed to be in where we try to be what we think Christian women should be like. We try to be, perfect in some ways or, you know, serious, like we were talking about. Yeah. Christian women don't have fun. They're not, they're not excited about things because they need to stay uh, pious and sober, Mm -hmm. you know? And we, Mm -hmm. I I do think that we put ourselves into boxes and that, that story was so, it was like looking in a mirror because I could see that in myself, you know, and, and just very much that I've in many ways done that. So I know our listeners will resonate with that story. But so where do we go from there when we realize, wow, I am not, I'm, I'm lacking fun in my life. I'm lacking fun in my spiritual life. I find prayer boring. I find my spiritual life mundane and there's a need for feeling the sun on your back and, and remembering who made you and rejoicing in that. What, um, do you have any practical suggestions for how to rediscover that, especially when it pertains to our, our prayers, whether it's praying 
for our children or grandchildren or praying with them or, or just women in general and spirituality? Yeah, I think it just really comes down to breaking out of the expected things that we put on ourselves that we're supposed to do. Whether that's we've gotten into a habit of thinking we need to wake up every morning and spend 15 minutes praying or in the word, not that that's bad, but I think it's okay to change things up and really find some sense of um, life in whatever we're doing instead of having it be habit. And I'm going to frame this in a different conversation. So I have a friend who for as long as I've known her, which is about 10 years, has wanted to lose 15 pounds. And so she would go to the gym five days a week. She hated going to the gym, but she did it because she felt like that's what she should do. And would never lost the 15 pounds because it just wasn't working. And so um, going to the gym always made her feel anxious and depressed and a little bit sad because she'd see 18-year-old butts on the treadmill next to her, which (laughs) let's be real, 18-year-old butts are only last so long. And, um, so she decided not long ago that she was going to get rid of her gym membership and take the money and invest it in something that she had always wanted to do, but that had always felt very frivolous and just something that she probably shouldn't spend her money on. She had always wanted to take tango lessons. And so she took her gym membership money, invested in tango lessons. And a few weeks after she did that, she texted me and said, that she had lost five pounds without even trying and was having the time of her life. And I wonder what that would look like if we did that with our spiritual lives or our prayer life. What would it look like to take the things that are just like draining the life out of us and instead invest our time and energy and resources into something that we've always wanted to do or something that we think could really give us or be um, invigorating or bring us vitality I wonder how that would change our view of the world and our view of God. That is, those are good words. I I love that idea. So it's going to look different for everyone, but you know, maybe if you love being outdoors, you meet with God outside, go on a hike and meet with God there instead of sitting in your prayer closet, you know, closed Mm -hmm. in, but yeah, yeah. Extrapolate from, (laughs) from that. Yes. But I think that is, that is just such great, great stuff. So definitely. Um, to our listeners, you definitely want to check out Mandy's book. And um, Mandy, if they want to connect with you online, on social media, where can they find you? I'm at Mandy Arioto on both Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Well, how can we be praying for you before we leave? We're going to leave you with a prayer. I would love. So Mops uh, influences hundreds of thousands of women across the globe. And I just would love prayer for moms who are navigating some tough stuff right now. I think all of us as moms recognize that there are seasons where we're like, I cannot even believe I am dealing with this situation. Mm -hmm. So um, that happens in my own life regularly and with so many moms that I meet across the world. So that would be phenomenal. All right. Well, thank you again for being with us, Mandy. We've just loved being able to talk with you today. Thank you. God, we just come before you today so thankful for this talk and just this time to talk about having more fun. Lord, I just pray for each person listening that you would just um, lift them up and, and allow them to receive what your words are, what specifically they can be doing to, to chase after you with passion instead of obligation and, and to have more fun in their spiritual lives and prayer lives. We lift up Mandy to you also, God, and just pray that you would just pour out your blessings on her as she just walks with boldness and with, um, with passion in, in the work that you've called her to God. And we just pray that you would pour into her, God, she's pouring out so much, pour your spirit out on her, just continue to give her enthusiasm and vision and energy for the things that she does in the day to day. We pray for her marriage. We pray for her, um, her family, for her job as mom, Um, for her job at MOPS, and we specifically pray for these women um, that she encounters daily and and that are a part of the MOPS organization um, that need encouragement, God, that need you desperately. We just pray that you would meet them where they are right now and whatever they're walking through, God, um, however impossible their situations seem, that you would just unleash your power in ways that, that they would know 
only could come from you, God, that you would just, in as they wait for tangible answers to their prayers, God, we pray that you would be meeting them with peace and comfort and hope and just transforming joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a comment to let us know what questions or topics we can address in future shows. Then hop over to prayingchristianwomen.com slash journal to download your free prayer guide. We're so glad you joined us for today's show, and we wish you God's deepest blessings as you draw closer to Him and change the world one prayer at a time.